Last week, we talked about this passage, the Olivet Discourse. Jesus, uh, one of Jesus' final words, speaking about the things that are to come. And we focus specifically on the events of A.D. 70, where God's judgment came upon Jerusalem 35 years. Jesus predicted this judgment would come in which the city would be destroyed, and it was by the Romans under the general Titus, which we learned about. Now, as we move through this text, there's this piece about persecution, which I think is very relevant to the church And so we're going to look specifically at that this time and see how God cares for us when it seems like the apocalypse now. Now, The suffering of the church is a difficult thing to kind of reconcile. So uh, a couple years ago, I got a great opportunity. My wife and I, we got to travel to Nepal. And we got to meet a bunch of different Christians in the country. We got to teach. I, I sort of felt weird being this guy from North America teaching these people because uh, this picture here, these four guys, I had to take their picture because they walked on foot for two days to come to this Bible conference. They live way up in the mountains in Nepal, and so they like walked on like footpaths so they could go to a place where they could get a bu- go to a bus and go down to Kathmandu and come to this Bible conference. And I felt a little weird because here I was, you know, we were staying in like a hotel with like running water and all this, and meeting these people who had come here on foot. We were praying just a few months ago for a group of 18 pastors in the country of Burma who had been arrested for their faith and weren't going to be let out unless they recanted their faith in Jesus Christ, separated from their families. Uh, Just last week, we were praying with Jennifer about her pastor who had been arrested in the country she serves. And there is so much suffering in the church. I... You know, I got the chance to, I went to the hospital this, this week to visit with Marilyn and seeing the suffering that she has to experience. And it's enough to make you cry. Like, like why, Lord, is there so much hardship? Why are there so many hard days for Christ's church? Jesus, after his death and resurrection, we just celebrated Easter. And one of the first questions his disciples asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. And his disciples, if you know, Jesus, he, he died on the cross, he's risen from the dead, and now is the time where he's going to usher in the kingdom, bring this unprecedented time of peace and prosperity to the church, to his people, but instead, he says this, but you will receive the power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Instead of a time of peace and prosperity, Jesus says, now there is work to be done. There is a mission. And this really gets to the first reason why things are hard for the church is that you don't expect ease when you're on a mission. Like if you're on a mission somewhere to do something, you don't expect it to be easy or else it would be like a vacation, not a mission. (laughs) People on mission don't ask how hard the work is. They figure out how to do the hard work. 
And yet, it's the last, like, God, why not make the mission easy, Lord? (laughs) You know, know, we're your people. Why not make it easy? Like, there's this longing for peace and harmony. and, And Jesus promises someday there will be the kingdom and it will be a reign of peace and prosperity. There will be no crying in heaven every tear will be wiped away the lion will lay down with the lamb the child will play with over the cobra's den there will not be hurt or destroy in in destruction in all of god's holy mountain and yet jesus warns us in this passage that our current experience as christians will be very different than this. And yet, as we will see, we go through, there is a purpose to the pain in the Christian life. There is always purpose to your pain. So this is Luke chapter 21, starting in verse 12. Jesus, as he's going on and talking about the great signs and things that will precede Jesus, will precede the destruction of Jerusalem. He says, before all this, before all this, they will lay hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and the prisons, and you will be brought before kings and governors for my name's sake. Persecution has always been a mark of the church of God. Now, it has ebbed and flowed. Now, there were times, even in the book of Acts, where things were going pretty well for the church. They were being built up, things were, things were fine, and then there were times when they had persecution. And even after the New Testament era, there are times when things are going really well. Then you get to like the third century, and Diocletian comes on. There's this horrible persecution of Christians right before the time of Constantine and the establishment of the, of the, of the church as the, official, as the official religion of Rome. And as we proceed through history, there are times when the church is very peaceful, and yet there are times when there is great suffering for Christians. If you look up Christian suffering now in countries where there's terrible persecution, and it's a huge list. You go right across Africa, Algeria, Libya, Egypt, Sudan, Saudi Arabia, Yemen, Iran, Afghanistan, India, China, Burma, all of these places which encompass, you know, huge populations where if you call upon the name of Jesus Christ, you may be risking imprisonment, you may even be risking your life. To seeing all the pain of the church is enough to make us cry out with the psalmist, how long, O Lord? How long will you look on? Rescue them from, your, from the destruction. Save them from the mouth of the lions. Like, Lord, why does your church suffer so much? Now we see this text. We should probably note that as Luke records this, most of these things, we actually all of these things we see in the book of Acts, they lay hands on and persecute pretty quickly. They arrested Peter and John, put them in custody for the next day. They were even killed. We see when Stephen goes up to, when he's preaching, they cast him out of the city and they stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. We see them brought before kings and governors before Festus and King Agrippa, Paul gave his defense before. Paul was promised that he would stand before Caesar. All of this suffering, Jesus said, would come upon the church. And all of it would be for his name's sake. Now, how did the church respond to these days? I mean, these were people that 
are made of the same stuff as us. And I don't know about you, but I generally, most days, I like to do the easiest thing. Like, I don't get up and think, oh man, I'm gonna just like suffer today. I think I'm gonna get up and I'm going to try to do things in the way that causes the least discomfort, you know? I don't wanna like go the hard way unless it looks really fun. Then I might go the hard way. Now, the church saw this suffering very differently than we did. And I see this most particularly in the book of 1 Peter. Like they saw suffering as an opportunity to glorify God. 1 Peter 4, 15, but let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer. And you're thinking, man, those are really serious things. Or as a meddler. It's like puts meddler after murderer, but you know, whatever. You know, you can suffer in small ways that are bad and good ways. Yet, if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. Now, this does one thing. One thing is, like, if you're suffering for your sin, like if you went out and just got blasted last night, and you're sitting in church and like, man, God, why did you give me this terrible headache? Okay, that's because, you know, you got drunk and that was bad, okay? God's reminding you of that. And it's a bit of a blessing, even though it's a bit of a blessing to teach you not to drink so much. But if you're suffering as a Christian, now some people, they like to take these texts and they're like, well, they're suffering for Christians, but it's just suffering when they're under persecution. But I I don't think that's the case. I think like the suffering as a Christian is any suffering that goes on. After all, Jesus in this life on earth, Jesus did not just suffer persecution. That wasn't all that he suffered on the way to the cross. He suffered the anxiety of things that were to come upon him. Like who suffers from anxiety? Like that's the suffering. He suffers from betrayal of a friend. Like that is also suffering. And so this is what this promise. Anyone suffers as a Christian, whether that be persecution in Burma or whether that be cancer in the hospital, let him glorify God in that name. Let him glorify God in the name of Christ. And so the church, when they suffered, they saw it as an opportunity to glorify God. Secondly, they recognize that there is a blessing in suffering. This is weird to think about. It says, but rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. This is a curious thing. So the blessing, the blessing here is, is because the spirit of the glory of God rests in you. And I, and I think how this works, so thinking about this, is it reminds me of the book of Job. Now in Job, you remember Job, he had a rich man, had all this blessing, and Satan comes to God and is just like, The only reason why Job is worshiping you is you give him lots of stuff. He's worshiping you for the moolah. Take it away, and he'll go away. So what happens? God allows Satan to take all of Job's stuff away. And even then, after he loses all stuff, he said, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away, blessed be the name of the Lord. And in that moment, Job is revealed to count God as more important than all of his stuff and his comfort. And in the same way, I think when he says, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you, that suffering reveals 
that God is this person's all in all. When they suffer and they look, they say, no, God is all in all. And so I can look at suffering and know the blessing because this is revealing that God, God's spirit rests upon me. Now, we are blessed because God is in us rather than our circumstances around us. So we often think blessing is is circumstantial, like we have this blessing. But our truest blessing is because God is in us rather than our circumstances around us. At the beginning of this verse, you get this, they rejoice insofar as you share in Christ's sufferings. And that's just kind of mind-boggling. You think, do these people really have everything together? Like, I don't exactly like, you know, maybe, you know, I could stoically, you know, bear my, I could stoically bear my cross waiting for some thing in the future. But they actually say, no, rejoice in the suffering. And you have to ask, how, how is this not some sort of psychological problem? Like, we, you know, we put people places who are like, you know, like this kind of like crazy things. Three reasons that I think their rejoicing makes sense. And the number one is Jesus told us so. Jesus told us so. And there's a certain like joy in when someone like predicts something. So Jesus said, time will come when they will persecute you and Difficult days are ahead, and there's this joy in getting something right. If you ever like watching a baseball game and someone is like Vlad Guerrero, he's going to hit a home run right here. And then, sure enough, some pitcher lobs one over the inner third, and bam, home run. We're just like high five. It was like, wow, you called it, man. And there's this joy in this. And we have the same joy when we suffer knowing that Jesus Christ called it. He said this was going to happen. And when it happens, we're not like, oh, how did this happen? We're like, no, Jesus said it. Secondly, they can rejoice because in some way they get to be like Jesus. And we want to be like Jesus, be like the Son of God, be like the greatest person ever. You know, we, we get enjoyment, like the kids, you know, you dress up, pretend to be a superhero. When we suffer, we get to put on the dress-up clothes of Jesus, because this is what Jesus did. Jesus suffered in the same way when we suffer. And the Bible goes through this again and again. Rejoice when you share Christ's sufferings. You get to a place like Romans 8, 17, if children and heirs, heirs of God, fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified with him. When we suffer in this life, we get to share in something that Jesus suffered here in such a way that it teaches us, if we're willing to look at it with our God goggles on, They'd be like, this is something that is uniting me more to Christ as I lean on him in this suffering. Third, they can rejoice because ultimately they believe the promise. And the promise isn't just be with Christ and you're going to suffer forever. The promise is be with Christ and you're going to suffer for this little momentary time of affliction which will give way to an eternal way of glory You can be glad when his glory is revealed. If we suffer with him, we will be glorified with him. And so this evidence of suffering with him is promise that we will be glorified. And we can look forward to that and we can know, yes, it's true. The suffering came. Yes, also the glory will come. Why are there so many hard days for Christ church? One, it's an opportunity to glorify Jesus' name. And that's that's an awesome thing. Every time we suffer, it's an opportunity to glorify. It's an opportunity to rejoice in Jesus' blessing. And this kind of like thing that almost seems unhinged, but when we look at it, when we look to Christ on the cross in his suffering and agony, we can know we can be more like him and look forward to an eternal hope of glory. And then third... 
The hard times are an opportunity to bear witness, and this is what Jesus gets right to. Verse 13, this will be your opportunity to bear witness. Now, I already told you about Jennifer's pastor we were praying for, and she told us, she was like, you know, he's in prison, we got to talk to him, and you know what he's doing in prison? He's witnessing to the prison guards and to the fellow prisoners, like he's there sharing the gospel, just like Paul and Silas in the book of Acts. Like this was an opportunity. Now Paul, you know, he's arrested, he used it as a time to witness. And you too, I mean, if it's, if it's like physical, if it's like persecution coming, like God will give you that opportunity to bear witness. And even if it is something like suffering with a physical ailment, say, you know, you experience the suffering of, of loss, you know, Mother's Day is always twins. We always remember Mother's Day, thinking of our, our daughter that died when she was 12 days old. And the two Mother's Days we got to spend, you know, without a child, and that always hits us in a way. We always remember that Mother's Day. And even in that, like, terrible time was opportunity to share the gospel with friends, with people who are far away, our friends from college came to that funeral, and, and there was opportunity, even through the tears, to point to the goodness of Jesus Christ. And God gives us this. This is, this is awesome. Settle it, therefore, in your minds, not to meditate beforehand how to answer. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom which none of your adversaries will be able to withstand or contradict. And, and this is so amazing because this is contrary. You think, you know, there's an opportunity to bear witness. Like, I've got to be ready for this. I'm going to, you know, stand up, reading my apologetics books, brushing up, watching the YouTube guys who are always so good at saying the right thing right there. And Jesus says, no, like, don't, don't bother to do that. Like, don't bother. You can have, you can have my study habits from school, which was not much. Sorry, professors, I didn't have to read all those papers. <laughs> you can just relax because God says, I will give you what to say in that moment. All you need to do is look at me. And this goes for the whole Christian life. Like following Christ is not like swinging a hammer. It's not like, it's like having an air nailer. You just put that thing there and you just press that button of faith. You trust God and kapow, all of the power is in God's hands. And so you trust God that day. You go to that place when maybe it's at the hospital. Maybe it's at a court case. Maybe it's at the execution dock. I don't know. All you need to do is trust God. All you need to do is look to Christ. And you will have words that no one will be able to withstand. Then it gets even more serious. You will be delivered up even by parents, brothers, relatives, and friends. It's like what a, what a text for Mother's Day. It's like some of you will have your mothers betray you. And it's happened. And some of you, they will put to death. You will be hated by all for my name's sake. Now, one thing here, we often think of these things kind of like end times kind of things, but I think Jesus puts these things here. Like he, he talks about this persecution and end times together just to give us hope that like every time we experience these, remember Jesus' redemption is not too far away. And secondly, we see this reality played out in the church again and again and again. Just a couple of years ago on Palm Sunday, April 9th, 49 people were killed in two churches in Egypt. And you hear numbers on the news and it, it just seems like, oh, you know, 49 people far away until you start to get a picture of this this is Michael, and uh, Sarah's going to tell her story. So they were going to church that Sunday, 
And Michael had a premonition that something was going to go wrong. Like there was, there was threats of people in these countries. They know when there's threats coming. And they knew, like, it might not be safe to met. And they went to church anyways. Like, shame on us for, like, we make excuses for anything. And they're like, they might, there might be a bomb. And they go. So they go. When he goes, he tells his wife and daughter, sit at the back. I'm worried about what might happen. Like he's a deacon, like he's in charge of the singing. He's sitting up in the front row. Near the end of the service, all of a sudden, a massive bomb explodes near the front of the church. Filled with smoke, people were screaming. She runs to the front of the church only to see her husband's lifeless body. She says, what I saw on my way to him was horrible, like a massacre had just taken place. The bodies of dead church members and pools of blood. Then I saw my husband. I was in shock. He was just lying there like the others, gone to heaven like he had sensed would happen. Sarah and Michael had been married for four years. They had a daughter named Priscilla. And they loved him so much. And and she says this, though. You're like, you know, like the Holy Spirit is speaking, like when she says this. Despite everything, God has put comfort, peace, and great grace in my heart. Despite everything, God has put comfort, peace, and great grace in my heart. So she doesn't worry about her husband because he's, he says, my husband lived a life of heaven on earth. He was always praying and reading the Bible. I am happy for him. He is in a good place now in heaven, in front of the throne of grace. He is, he, he is there with Jesus. I says, some of you will be put to death. Why are there so many hard days for Christ's church? It's an opportunity to glorify Jesus' name. It's an opportunity to rejoice in Jesus' blessing that comes with suffering. An opportunity to bear witness. Now, in some ways, like, to me, this still sounds like a little bit of a bad deal. Like, I, I'm still not totally excited about the whole bomb exploding thing. Especially, yeah, my family always sits in front <laughs> But here's the promise, and this is amazing. Jesus just said, some of you, will, they will kill, in the next line, but not a hair of your head will perish. By your endurance, you will gain your lives. Like, what? Like, Jesus, you just said, some of you, they will be put to death. What about Stephen falling under the Pharisees' stones? all the way through church history to Michael, the singer, dying in church, and still people today dying for Jesus Christ. What about them? Jesus says, not a hair of your head will perish. And that word perish there, that's, it's, it's like to be destroyed to be lost because none of it is going to be lost. Like you may lose your arm, you may lose your head, but nothing will be lost in it because God will not lose sight of any one thing. All will be restored a hundredfold. And if you keep your mind on the fact that nothing can really be taken away, nothing can be taken away. This life apart from Christ, everything will be taken away from you. But with Christ, nothing will be taken away. God will hold not even the slightest hair of your head. For some of us, this is a particularly awesome promise. Not a single hair of your head will be lost in the end that will not be restored when God brings his kingdom. This... I think allows us to look seriously that the mission is hard. Go to the ends of the earth, but to approach it boldly. 
knowing that even the hardest things we may face are opportunities and the worst occasion in our lives is mere, a mere prelude to everything being restored a hundredfold in God's kingdom. Let's pray. Oh, Lord God, help us to keep our eyes fixed on you so that when we go through the hardest events of our lives, we will use them as an opportunity to find your blessing, to find rejoicing, to find opportunities to point others towards the all-surpassing worth of Jesus Christ. We thank you for your promise that in you not a single hair of our head can be lost and that we can have, we can have joy even as we face the darkest day. Lead us in your paths. Make us like you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'd like to call for the uh, ushers to uh, take up the offering today. And as they come forward, we're just going to commit it to God. Lord God, in anything that we give, I pray that we'd be able to give it with joy for the building of your kingdom and uh, find the blessing that comes with letting things go. In Jesus' name, amen.